With all the branding and the focus on marketing your work and the studio and whatnot, where did you learn all of this? Like, did you just trial and error, pick it up from people? Because I think one of the like the important things about the independent community is learning from one another. Yeah. So, the way you learn anything is not by reading books about it; it's by doing it, right? So, the way I learned branding is fifty percent me just thinking about how this probably works, and trying that, see how it works out, and 50% talking to others. It's uh, one of the, like, like you mentioned, one of the great things about the indie scene is that it's um, a pretty open bunch, right? You can just walk up to you, or me, or Can you walk up anyone. to yourself? That's confusing. <laughs> walk up to anybody that does indie game development and ask them questions, and they won't hate you for asking questions. Like that's something that a lot of people seem to think, but yeah. at the at the start when Flamber was just starting out, like one of the people that we talked to a lot was Adam Saltzman, um, who was this like major hero of ours. But we sort of just chatted to him at GDC and sort of got like a feeling for what kind of person he was, and we figured out something really important. Like he was just a normal guy making games, and he was really good at it because he'd been doing it a lot. But it's sort of interesting to realize that they are, you know, just, just people. Just people. Yeah. They're like in my in, in your mind, they're like this sort of legendary thing. Where like Adam Saltzman, he has like all these amazing games. Uh, Greg Woolwind, who's like in the audience here, when I met him, I was like, no, <laughs> no. When I when I like seriously, when I met you, I was like, holy shit, this is the guy that made <clears throat> Solid Skier, and I'm talking to him. That's like really weird. I was a little bit intimidated too, and because I had met him at the Independent Games Festival Awards, we sat at the same table, and then I didn't even realize it till a year later, and I was like, holy shit, you're Greg. Yeah, he's also bald and scary and has a hoodie. <laughs> that, might, that might factor into that. Yeah. But um, the, 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 the way you learn anything in this scene, I suppose, as an indie, is just like, you do stuff, you're not afraid to make choices, and you talk about the things you're gonna do with others. Um, and there are so many ways to get in touch with most people that it's sort of baffling that not everybody does that. Um, for branding Vlambeer, that was actually sort of a lucky thing. Uh, the way we came up with our persona was by giving our first talk. And our first talk, we realized that me and JW were sort of bitching on the stage at each other, like we were just making jokes about each other. And we were like, this kind of looks like, when we were looking at the footage, it was like, this kind of looks like some shitty rock band. <laughs> so we went with the rock band persona from that point on. Um, and then we noticed like it worked, like people sort of resonated with it, like people that were just, they thought like, so here's two guys making games, telling like, like not, not being careful about what they say, right. just saying whatever the hell they think. And people appreciated that. At least I like to think that they appreciated that. Well, I think it's one of the things about <clears throat> being independent, is you can kind of just share whatever. You can be a person. Yeah. You can have opinions. You're not like it's not that if I say something shitty about EA, you know, what are they going to do? Like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Like I I really don't like I really don't like the way Steam implemented greenlight. I mean, I wouldn't I, like I it would I, it would take a long time before I'd hear like any really big company say that. Right. But I don't like it. So what? Like that's my opinion. Uh, well, and for, for companies who actually work well with indies, I think one of the great things is they're usually open to that sort of feedback. Of course. Like, the, the interesting thing of working um, with Steam and Sony so far, for us, has been that they, um, they understand what, they start to understand, like, companies are starting to understand what indie is and how um, different that is from the way it used to be, where you communicate with, like, EA through um, the PR manager who then like delegates his work to like the senior mm -hmm. PR guy who delegates his work to the junior PR guy who delegates it to like the junior junior PR intern. Well, I mean, people have been looking for your monetization expert for years now, right? Yeah. Decades. <laughs> no, it's, it's um, like it's been really interesting since Flamber has been growing so much that you sort of reverse roles where people start asking me questions. Um, that's been sort of weird. Yeah. Um, like to give a talk about monetization here for you, 
still is kind of weird in my mind. Like, because the way I look at it, I'm just a dude that tried it and came up with something that works for me. Like I said, if you have a better way to do it, please do it that way and see if it works. Like unless it is like we're going to make money uh, by throwing money at people and hoping they throw it back. <laughs> like use common sense. But if you have like, if you have like an idea, just try it. Um, and I just got, I got to this seat by just basically trying that. And if something didn't work, like try again. Yeah. I think that's one of the, the big things about, like one of the things I, the reason why I dropped out of education, like this is a really big t detour by the way. <laughs> one of the reasons I dropped out of education is because I, th I kind of feel, felt like education has this problem where they teach you to be afraid of failure. You know, you want to get like a good grade because if you don't get a good grade, you're gonna you're fail the class, yeah. and you won't get your your you won't graduate, and your life will be terrible, and you'll be cleaning shoes for the rest of your life because <laughs> you didn't get a six out of ten or higher. I don't know how do how do scores work? Yeah, I mean that's it's pretty here. accurate. Yeah, that's yeah. how they work here too. Shoe cleaning is below six, <laughs> specifically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I mean. That's sort of what school teaches you, right? It's kind of what society teaches us. It's like failure is bad. Failure is the best thing ever. It's what you learn the most from. It, well, I mean, I mean success is like even more awesome because you also <laughs> learn from well, success. Yeah. But um, I mean, you learned a lot from Octodad, and yeah. that wasn't a failure. It was a success. Yeah. But surprisingly, the reason you could make an Octodad is because you didn't go like. Oh God, a game about an octopus ragdoll physics simulator in mundane situations. You didn't go like, that is going to be terrible and we're just not going to do it. You went like, we'll see what happens. I think right? if we had pitched it to anyone, they would have said that. But we just went forward with it. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, weren't, you weren't afraid to fail. And like, I think in many ways, uh, indie game development is a lot about not being afraid to fail with things. It's like if you fail something, if something doesn't work out, you just kind of go like, yeah. Okay, I learned something. I, like, if you don't <laughs> learn something from your failures, like that's like that's when you have problems. That's that's yeah. like an actual failure. That's like you should be worried about that. If you fail at something and go like, let's do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I think they call it insanity. Yeah. Like, except, oh God. Parkour <laughs> three was pretty good. But uh, <laughs> have there ever been times where you've actually struggled with that? Like when someone's like, this is a terrible idea, and you're actually caught up on. Every, every, everything we've ever done with Vlambeer has been labeled a terrible idea by at least <coughs> 20 people. Like having a logo drawn in MS Paint has been called yeah. like a terrible idea by so many. Uh, having a name that doesn't make sense to anybody has been called a terrible idea. Making a game about collecting crates has been called a terrible idea. Making a game about shooting fish drawn in MS Paint has been called a terrible Like everything we do is a, like I made do press kit, which right. was like a free, uh, it's a free tool to make your own press kit. Um, in like an easy way. Um, I made that and I made it free and everybody's like, that's a stupid idea. Why do you make it free? Well, because that's what I made it for and that's the way it's going to be. And if, you know, that's going to bite me in the ass some way, whatever, I'll see it when that happens. It's just, you don't, you don't, you know what you want to do and you're figuring out how to get there and like the last thing you should be worried about is like, whether other people think it's a clever idea. Because like the truth is the way people look at the world is pretty boring. Like if you ask anybody what they want, they won't be like they will be able to give you answers, but they won't be able to like tell you whether they want what you're making. Because they don't know, because they haven't tried it yet, because you haven't made it yet. Right? So what you do is you think it's gonna be good, so you do it. You try it. And then when you're done, you give it to them and you see how they respond. Not the other way around. You go and don't go like, you know what, I'm going to make, like, if you had asked, I saw this video a few weeks ago. On the internet. On the internet. Hmm. It's this really great place where you can watch videos, like all day if Just you're bored. Cats. No, it ha didn't have cats. Hmm. Um, the video was, uh, it was shot in the 1980s and it was... Uh, a news show where they were interviewing people about this new thing called a mobile phone. 
And they asked people whether they were looking forward to mobile phones. They went like, uh, I've, got like I've got an answering machine. Right. I don't really need a mobile phone. Like, I'll just you know, check my messages when I get home. Well, look at the world now. I have to like, turn off my mobile phone. Yeah, mine's sitting on my like, lap. So. Oh, because I could get like a Skype <clears> message or something. It's like people don't know, like in general, people don't know whether they want what you're making until you've made it. And what's with, interesting with you guys is like taking that approach and just being like, we're going to do whatever, deal with it, and yet you still draw attention from publishers and distributors and things like that who then come to you and being like, hey, what, we want to work with you, but what, what should we do, like Devolver? Yeah, well, so I think the thing is that we're just, we, like we do all this stuff because we feel that it's going to work. We, like I said, we make, we spend most of our time making prototypes of stuff that we throw away. And the only time we actually work on something is if me and JW agree that it's a good thing. Now that doesn't sound like much, but me and JW agreeing is like, it's like <laughs> the, the chances are big as you like winning the lottery and getting struck by lightning and like getting hit by the ambulance that comes to save you on <laughs> like within an hour. Yeah. And like me and JW don't agree about anything. So when we agree, we like, it's probably like a pretty good idea uh, to see if there's something there. And then usually we still go like two weeks afterwards because we find out it's a terrible idea anyway. Um, but when we do something, we like fully go for it. When we were making Gun Gods, which is a first person shooter <laughs> on Venus, uh, in which you're trying to escape the hotel of a record labor holder who also happens to be the god of guns. Um, in that game, uh, one of the most important things was we wanted to make a game about gangster rap. So we listened to a lot of like <laughs> Notorious B.I.G. and like 50 Cent and all that stuff. And we still haven't fully recovered from that. <laughs> but it's, you take your stuff, like you take, we took that really seriously. It would have been really right. easy to, ta to take Gun Gods and turn it into a satire of gangster rap. But that was not what we were going to make. We were going to make a game about gangster rap, and we were fully serious about that. And I think the, the reason publishers um, and other uh, companies like Sony or platform holders have been interested in that is because they realize that if we do something that we're going to go for it like 190%, that we'd rather like work ourselves like to this far from death than like release something that we don't really like. And the other thing they realize is that we're serious about the business stuff. We're not just two guys like fucking around and sort of making stuff. We're like two guys that know what we're doing and we know how, what we want to get and how we're going to get it. And that makes us sort of a stable factor. Like even though we're like this weird crazy thing that keeps doing stuff like, if we decide we want to do like a PlayStation Vita game tomorrow, we're going to do a PlayStation Vita game tomorrow. And if we decide that's going to be a PlayStation 3 game, we're going to do a PlayStation 3. If we decide we want to, go to work on Wii U, we'll get in touch with Nintendo tomorrow. You're just dropping all of your trade secrets right now. Shouldn't be telling that, right? <laughs> Probably not. But yeah, we're not doing anything for Wii U. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one of the things I find interesting about all of that is just that a lot of the times I've noticed like people outside of games or outside of creative mediums see like me and my team talking about something and we're like passionately arguing about the stupidest things or at least what would seem stupid sure. to an everyday person but in the end I think those conversations are what matter and what create things that are so interesting yeah no I, like a lot of times like me like me and JW had a two-day argument about the shape of the clouds in loop trousers right it's like the silliest thing he wanted like outlines and I wanted like filled clouds he wanted like so, some sort of stylistic sort of Chinese painting style clouds um, and I just wanted clouds. <laughs> no, I just wanted things that looked like clouds. And we argued about it for two days until like, he finally yielded and was like, OK, you might be right. It should probably just be clouds. Um, and it sounds like the stupidest thing to argue about. But the way I looked at it was like, this is like, the, these clouds are in this game for a reason. Because if we didn't need them, we wouldn't have them. So they should be as good as possible. And I didn't like the lines because they looked like wind. That was the only reason. Like I, I thought they didn't communicate cloud well enough. And I wanted them to communicate cloud. I wanted like, people to go, like, that's a cloud. And I'd, like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> so 
So we argued about it for two days. You won that battle. I won that. No, no, it's not like it's not <laughs> like me and JW don't have this thing where like if I think something, he just goes like, "No, you're the business guy. You're the suit. Right? Don't 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 touch my designs." It's like we respect, like we might not always like each other, like we might generally not like each other, <laughs> but we do respect each other's tra like each other's sort of knowledge in what they do. Like right. I would never second guess any value that JW comes up with for like the size of an explosion. Because he knows his explosions, <laughs> right? Yeah. I wouldn't second guess him on like core mechanics. If I don't like the core mechanics, I'll just tell him like we're probably not making this game because I'm not feeling it. <laughs> but like I know that somewhere in there there's something solid, but it might just take too long to get them out of there. Um, but we argue about stuff all the time. I guess like arguing about little things, argu like arguing about everything, is like a really good way to be making games. As long as you don't like get stuck in arguing. Right. Like, you don't know when to kill something. Yeah, yeah, but it's also that thing where um, I've seen so often that people get stuck in just like arguing and just don't remember that you can also just prototype. <laughs> like that, yeah. it's it's such a stupid thing. But I've seen so many times people like argue about. Should the jump be like? Should the jump speed be like 1.2 or 1.4? And then they argue about like the repercussions and like the effects of that for like a day and a half. Well, I'm pretty sure that changing a two into a four in code takes about 20 seconds if you're really slow with keyboards. <laughs> like, it yeah. ta it takes like a minute to figure out which one is better. Right. Like in most cases, so you should be arguing about like. You, you probably should be arguing about like high level stuff or stuff that you know doesn't have an easy way to test it. Just talk about it, like figure out like why there are different opinions. Um, but don't get stuck like arguing for no reason. It's like the same thing I do with playtests, me and JW with playtesting. Like uh, this might sound sort of arrogant, but uh, when we do playtests, we usually don't really um, listen to what our playtesters are telling us. Because what we're looking for is like the way they're playing the game and the way we're they're like they're responding to it. Like, if they say, I, I used this example today, like with a group of people that were showing me a game. Um, if they say like, we had we had a super crate box. We had no, not super crate box. We had it in one of our games. We had like a weapon that was. Um, people felt that it was too strong. So at that point, we were still like sort of like, okay, they say it's too strong. Let's try making it weaker. Then we gave them like the game again with the weaker gun, and they were like, "Now the gun is too weak." So we were like, "So, but, so, what do you want?" And what turned out that they meant is like in one specific room, like they killed like all the enemies really easily, and they felt that the challenge was gone. So what we did is we gave those energy, enemies more health. That was what they were getting at. They weren't getting at like the gun is too strong. They're not game designers like usually. If the, if you're here, they're probably game designers. But like um, yeah. in general, like with playtests. You know what you're getting at. You know what you're trying to do. So if they're saying something, like treat that as a symptom instead of like the thing that you're trying to fix. Like they're saying something. What is it that they're trying to get at? Like what what thing failed in my design, or in the way I'm approaching this, that doesn't make this work or makes them feel that way? Instead of just going like, yeah, the gun is too strong. Let's make it weak. Right. It's like arguing and like. That type of arguing like allows you to sort of explore your thoughts a bit, and, like get deeper into stuff that you might otherwise not get to. With you guys caring about games <clears throat> as much as you do, and as much as is obvious through the way you talk about them and the way you market your games and things like that, how did you? I hate to bring it up, but I have to. Okay. How did you guys recover from from the cloning thing? Um, because at one point, I think you guys were about ready to call it quits, and I think yeah, any normal studio might. Yeah, uh, we, we almost stopped. Um, okay, so the weird thing is, with Ridiculous Fishing, when that got cloned, like that was, like personally for me, that was like a major blow because um, we had this amazing team working on it. Uh, we had an amazing musician, uh, a bald artist. Uh, and a really good programmer. Um, I think he's asleep. Yeah, he might be. <laughs> and um, 
I, like obviously I was doing the business on that. Um, and then the game got cloned, like out of nowhere. And that kind of feels like personal defeat. Like, it, I, I'm pretty sure it felt pretty shitty to everyone. But to me, it was like more of the thing where the whole internet was basically going like, well, of course you got cloned. It's a good game. And you took like at least six months to port it. Like whoever is in charge of like that thing, he's an idiot. As if that's a good excuse. Uh, of course it's a shitty, like it's the internet. Right. People, people will say shitty things. That's, that's the internet. But it, the entire team like just got this giant motivational blow where we knew that if we were to release Ridiculous Fishing at that point, like we'd just be in trouble for releasing a game that released like three weeks ago. And we knew that it, the longer we were going to wait, the more likely it was going to be that people that played Ridiculous Fishing would just go like, hey, I've played this before. Wasn't this like the, the game with the ninja? Like, at that point, we didn't like just lose like a business thing, like uh, 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 the like the money that we might have made if we released first on iOS. We also lost like sort of the creative ownership of like shooting or killing fish after flinging them up into the air. Um, that hurts a lot. I mean, that that was such a massive blow. To like our motivation. Every time you open up your laptop and you kind of look at like the project, you just kind of go like, "I don't really want to work on this. Like, I I just don't. I just." So the way we recovered is like we had three things that helped us through. Um, one was the fans, like people just going like, "You know, guys, this is super shit. Uh, we we super appreciate what you do." A lot of people like. Uh, bought Serious Sam the Random Encounter for like way more than they should have paid like then. Uh, a lot of tweets and support. The other thing was like the press, like getting into the New York Times and like seeing all those articles being written. Um, like also sort of letting the world know that this was an important thing, that this cloning thing was like creating an issue in the game industry where like creativity was getting a risk. Like being creative was getting like turning into a risk because if you were creative, like you were doing the R and D for companies that would just copy whatever you did and just add like more user friendly art on it, like McDonaldize your game. So that was an issue, and like the press really jumped on that. And suddenly we were in the New York Times, we had all these opportunities to speak at like conventions and sort of. That was sort of like our way to deal with that, with like that feeling of like uselessness at that point, it was just like informing others like of how dangerous this could be to the gaming industry. And then the third thing uh, that got us through was actually like just having the team. Like just, you know, we all knew that we should be finishing the, that, that we should be finishing the game. Um, so at some point, um, me and Greg and Zach met up in New York and sort of like kicked against the ball, hoping to get it rolling again. Like, it didn't really start rolling at that point, but it sort of moved, which was a really great feeling, like just not being stuck in like the same build that we'd been stuck in for like a year and a half at that point. And um, then for some, I'm not, still not really quite sure what happened, but uh, we were almost done with Luftrausers, and we sort of started working on Ridiculous Fishing again, and Greg like flew to New York uh, to, to um, work at Zach's place for like a few uh, weeks. And Zach and Greg basically murdered themselves, like, <laughs> wrapping up the game. And me and JW, like, sort of jumped in at, like, the appropriate times. Uh, and then, like, the last few weeks has just been, like, this absurd effort to get the game done. And as things started falling together, like, as things fell into place, like, everything sort of clicked. There was this really weird moment where we were discussing that the game turned from like an arcade game about shooting fish into uh, sort of an adventure game. And then we were discussing that we should probably like look at things from like maybe like sort of look at the game from a different angle. And at that point, we just like got super excited because something like really big happened. Um, and from that point on, it's just been wrapping up the game. It's really weird how motivation works. It's like if there is anything that is like worth more than money it's like sort of your mental um, st like it's not stability but like your motivation 
If you lose that, you can have like all the money in the world and you still won't be able to make anything. It's like the most fragile thing that you have is like your motivation. I think it's one of the hardest things about being <clears throat> independent it's is like learning how to find like what does and does not motivate you. And I think it's one of the hardest things about being creative. Yeah. At least I wouldn't be able to be creative for money. Like I can't do that. I just need to make certain things. Um, and then the money is like the way to feed myself. Right. Just the essentials. <clears throat> yeah. Have you guys ever thought about expanding your universes? Like with Super Crate Box, have you ever thought about making a game about the people who make the boxes or something like that? So it's actually funny you say that. Uh, we tend to have a lot of fiction to our games. Right. Like our games tend to have like, we know like everything. We know where the, bo we know where the boxes come from and we know like, um, Who's the good guy and the bad guy in Super Crate? Like, there's a good guy and bad guy in Super Crate Box, and there's a story to Super Crate Box, and there's like, like we discuss this all the time. We're just like, we're basically sort of talking about like how do our worlds work and why do they work, and we don't tell people how they work because that is not relevant. Right. It's not for them. It's not for the players. It's for us to make a game that makes sense. I feel like it almost takes away some of the, like the magic. Yeah, like, of course. You want them to sit there and contemplate, like, well, where do these boxes come from? Why are the Why am I shooting these little things? You know. I bought I bought this book. Yeah. It's a science fiction book. I bought this in like a, a bookstore, uh, myopic books. Um, I was walking there a while ago, and uh, I bought this book, and it's a science fiction book. And it's like the worst but best kind of science fiction. It's the type of science fiction that explains everything. It's like. Through the space-time hyperfold of a double black hole <laughs> is the first line of, of like the blurb. <laughs> and it w like obviously it ends in like and save a universe on the edge of destruction. There's like no way that that. Well, you have be. to save the universe. Otherwise, it's not a good science <clears throat> fiction. Right. But it's like you have this this things are usually better when you leave when you imply fiction. Like it's not it, fiction and narrative are like not the same thing. Uh, that's something people tend to sort of, it's something that you need to sort of figure out at some point in your life, like if you're doing anything with fiction or narrative. Like fiction is like the sort of implied thing in the background. It's like the way the world sort of works, while uh, narrative is sort of like the story that you're like explicitly trying to tell in some way. Um, our games are like full in fiction and we're not going to expand on that. Like ridiculous fishing is this weird thing where we are expanding on the fiction of radical fishing, but um, that was not the goal of ridiculous fishing. The goal of ridiculous fishing was, hey, we made this flash game that was pretty good, but we think that we, it could be better. Um, and it could be on iOS. So let's make this game, but better on iOS. And then it ended up expanding the fiction. But then like Luftrauser and Luftrausers, you know, we're not expanding on fiction at all. We're just making the same game, but um, with better gameplay and like more options to, to um, more airplanes to pick from and to like build and fight with. Like it's, it's a gameplay iteration of Luftrauser. We kind of like to think of like 2010 when we started was like we made Radical Fishing and Super Crate Box and then 2011 was we just made a whole like ton of games. Then in 2012, like while we were sort of recovering from the ridiculous fishing thing, we just spent our time on like looking at the best stuff we made that wasn't as like that warranted like further exploration, and um, Luftrausers was like the one game that we wanted to explore further, uh, Luftrausers, and uh, Radical Fishing was the other one. But we were already working on that, so we spent 2012 doing mostly that. So I know at least with us, um, we draw a lot of inspiration from like other studios and other. Indies and yes. AAA studios and whatever. Like, <clears throat> do you guys do that in all aspects, like business, marketing, etc.? Like, see, hey, oh, these guys are doing this. That's really cool. Maybe mm. we should do something similar or better. Or no, not not no, <laughs> uh, no, not at all. Actually, um, we like to get our inspiration for everything from like every place that is not the thing we're trying to do. Like our game designs are mostly inspired by documentaries and shitty science fiction. Um, Radical Fishing was inspired by a documentary. Yeti Hunter was inspired by a documentary. Uh, some of our games are inspired by movies, 
or things we saw or things we ran into. But like the only thing we're trying to not get inspiration from is video games, because uh, we actually have a rule at Flambeard that we can't discuss any ideas using other games. Like we can't say like an inventory system like in Diablo 2, because that like with that comes. If you go like inventory system like in Diablo 2, there are so many assumptions that you add on to that just because you're saying like we're going to do this like these guys do it. And that's sort of like if you if you look at that specific example it means like okay inventory system like in Diablo 2 so you have items that have like different sizes and you sort of stack them together and you try to rearrange them like optimally. Well that might not be the best thing for your idea uh, for your game specifically it was like the best idea for Diablo probably. Uh, so we try to get our inspiration for everything from like other stuff. Um, for business, like I try to not be inspired. <laughs> it's like business. It's like the the thing that I'm trying to do is like do it in the most optimal way. Mm -hmm. So if I come across something that works better than the way I do it, I start doing that. Like it's it's not really inspiration. Business business is creative in some ways, but that's mostly like the marketing aspects, like legalities. You don't want to get creative with legalities. <laughs> Ma well, maybe with finance. <clears throat> But I think when you're making deals with people, like knowing them can make a huge difference. Yeah, but that's—I uh, like that. mean—that's that's empathy. Yeah, um, that's like <laughs> to be a human. Yeah, it's to 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 not be completely like apathic towards the other person. Like empathy is a big deal of like marketing anyway. Yeah, it's it's actually a big deal of like everything we do. It's like a big deal of making games as well is sort of like understanding your player because you're trying to have like a conversation with your player through your game. If you're not caring about like whether they get what you're saying, like they probably won't get it. Like that's also a valid way of game. Like I'm always scared of saying things about like what is the right or not right way to make games because if you want to make a game where you just completely don't care about your player, please do that. Like, if that's what you want to make, do that. Like what I love about the indie game scene is that you can do whatever you want. If like if you feel that that would be an interesting experiment to just go and make stuff and not care about your player, please do that. I don't know what will happen. Maybe it'll be awesome. So this might put you on the spot. <clears throat> oh, but uh, I'm kind of on the spot. Right well, now. yeah, I mean, we're both on okay. the spot. But what are, what, are, what are you doing wrong right now, and what are we doing wrong in general? Like, or, or OK, I can bring it down to marketing. What do you think that we're doing poorly? That's a tough question. I think I might, I might like just want to hear, like want to see more of Octodad in the press. Mm -hmm. uh, I've like I I know I see a lot of you guys on like your blog, and I follow you guys, and your community is like super solid. It might be cool to just see a news article pop up someday <laughs> and go like, hey, you guys, Octodad is still underway. Yeah. Um, besides that, you're doing a great job. Oh, of, thanks. Uh, marketing Octodad. Um, I mean, you kind of have like this crazy idea that sort of marketing, um, sort of helping you market it because it's an amazing idea. But I know that like even with a good idea, it's still a shit ton of work yeah. to get it out to people and to get people to remember it. Um, I think you're doing a great job. Like Octodad, like I said, at PAX East, I was kind of worried that having Octodad next to Vlambeer might be an issue um, <laughs> for Vlambeer. <laughs> Well, see, we wanted to actually be next to you because we thought we were so different, and yet we still kind of... Yeah, well, I mean, like, obviously it sort of worked out. Uh, a lot of people that looked at Octodad then came to our booth, but it's still sort of weird to be standing there and have people going like, hey, the game with the octopus. We still think it's weird that people like it, so... <clears throat> it's a game about being an octopus uh, that pretends to be a dad. I, I mean, think, yeah. I mean, I think you and I have probably yammered enough, for now, yeah. at okay, least. Okay, sure. But uh, I think we're going to take questions on the mic over there. So if anyone has any uh, or wants to just yell at us, if over by the nice us, that'll be fun. woman with the pink hair. Can I just yell? You it, can yell. Yeah. What, what challenges have you faced? What are the biggest challenges you faced starting a company from just being in question? So what challenges have we faced biggest. starting? Well, obviously, eating noodles for three months was a big challenge. Uh, but I guess the biggest challenge is like starting. Like it's the easiest part and it's the hardest part. 
Like starting a company and starting to make games is like easy. You open up whatever program you want to use and you start. And if you start a company, you like go to the Chamber of Commerce and you start. And then you have like this point where you've started and then you need to get somewhere. Um, and that's a rough sort of thing. It's like every time something like really big happens, you sort of have to um, reorientate and like Every yeah. time Vlambeer has grown, like significantly, has been like a, a challenge because you have to sort of readjust like what you're doing and like figure things out. Uh, but I think the biggest challenge for us has been like the motivation thing after Ridiculous Fishing, after the clone, like that. Like we almost quit at that point, just like <laughs> shit, we're going home. I don't want to. I don't want to make games anymore. Uh, I'll just you know, I'll just become a doctor. Uh, no big. Easy. Something like that. Uh, help people, like, not be sick or something. <laughs> like, I, I really wanted to give up at points. Uh, but I guess, like, in most cases, like, just getting from, like, starting to, like, um, like, being something that people care about, like, getting there is, like, the hardest part. And then it's, like, <laughs> it's like the video game, like, making a video game thing. They, they have the saying, like, Making a game is like um, the the, what, the last ten percent is like ninety percent of the yeah, work. That sort yeah. of thing. Well, so actually, it's more like the first ninety percent of ninety <laughs> is not like ninety percent of the work, and then the last ten percent are like another ninety percent of no, the work. Yeah. I mean, as soon as you get to the point where you are something, you have to keep that like sort of going, and that's like really hard as well. Actually, like the whole thing is a challenge. <laughs> it's like, just I'll, hard. I'll be, I'll, yeah. I'll, be I'll, I'll be honest. Like everything is a challenge. Like there is not a, there's not a there's not a day where I don't go like, holy shit, there is so much I need to do. Like, tomorrow I fly to New York where I have to give another talk, and I have to start on that talk like, after this at some point, um, and then go to like, another thing. Um, but in the meanwhile, I'm launching a game, Ridiculous Fishing, on iOS like, pretty soon. So I'm revving up for that. And we're working on Luftrauss, just finishing that. Uh, so I'm also sort of like, programming and doing stuff. Um, and it's a lot of work for like, two guys to be doing all this. Uh, but it, we, you know, the reason you go through these challenges is because it's what you want to do. Like, the only, like, I guess the, the real way to, like, fail at this is not wanting to do what you're doing. Like, if, that, if you're not doing what you want to do, like, please find out what you want to do and do that instead. Um, but I guess it's just a challenge. It's, it's, it's never going to be easy. Right. I've, uh, do you, like, is your I don't, I don't think easy? I'd want it to be easy. No, that was if it was if it was easy, it probably wouldn't be worth doing. If it were easy, that yeah, no, yeah. you're right. If if there was like, hey, this is like A and this is like B, and we need to get from A to B, <laughs> and we know like this is the shortest path. Like you there's know no there's doing. like no reason to go from A to B because right. you know what you're gonna get when you get there. Yeah, or, yeah. Do we have anybody else who have is that like a good answer to your question? Yeah, thank you. Great. You can run over there to the mic. Um, so I've made one game, and I'm still relatively new to. But I, uh, what I'm mo mostly struggling with now and trying to move towards my second game is just how to come up with that idea. And I was just curious whether you, in terms of Super Crate Box and Ridiculous Fishing and all those things, if you think of the idea before anything and then make it, or if you sort of do an iterative process. Because with, with my game, I sort of just one day was like, I'm just going to make a cool grid. And then I, a couple days later, I move the made it so you can move the rows in the grid around and then you know and eventually it just kept turning into this game and eventually it had this idea and uh so i'm just wondering how you guys kind of come up with your ideas for us it's been like it's been really different like every time um some games just happen like from watching a documentary about tuna fishing um, some games just happened because we were toying around in like Game Maker. We use Game Maker a lot for prototyping because like JW is amazing at Game Maker. So he'll just be like toying around and going like, "Dude, this is this is actually cool." Um, but like I guess like ideas are not really the the important part, right? It's like ideas are a dime a dozen. Like everybody can have. If I like ask anybody in the in the room here to have like a game idea, they could probably do it in like 30 seconds, and it will probably be terrible. Uh, if you'd ask me for a game idea in 30 seconds, it would also probably be terrible. Like, but you don't know whether it's going to be terrible unless you sort of try it. Um, 
so I guess the, the main thing is just like keep trying. Like I said, like n having an idea and like figure out that it's bad is like still infinitely better than just not trying. Uh, so if you have like this idea where you go like this is going to be terrible or like I'll just do something, like just do that and you don't know where you're going to end up. Yeah, can you do the microphone oh, thing? Oh, you just got it. Hi. Um, I was wondering, after the success of like your first game, or just any game, how do you get out of that mindset that you were in during that game and move to a completely different project without like either hanging on the success of your previous one or trying to live up to the expectations of the previous game? Well, trying to live up to the expectations of the previous game has like a, been a big issue for us. Because if you start out with like a game that is sort of received like Super Crate Box, <laughs> I'm not looking forward to that. <coughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. After that, uh, yeah, I can imagine. Um, of course, you're going to worry of how people are going to receive the next thing. I guess, like, sort of not giving a shit is like a pretty good sort of way to deal with that. Um, like, we don't. We we always have this sort of mindset. We don't. Like, the reason we make games is because we like making them. Um, and that has like pretty consistently helped us through like most of it. Um, although I have to say, like it's it's absolutely like after Super Crate Box, like it's really weird to get into the mindset of a different game. Um, but um, we also sort of fixed that by just be working on like five projects at once. Um, like I said, we're working on two projects at the moment, um, and like two other ones that we haven't really announced, and then one port of another game. Uh, to another platform. <laughs> Do you guys think you'll ever focus on one like huge project? What for is, well, if 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 I knew what focus was, I might <laughs> consider it. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty terrible at. It. Like, well, like like I said, like like somewhat like unorganized. It's like part of our persona. Right. The reason it's part of our persona is because that's one of the things both me and JW are. We're like pretty unorganized. Um, We'll just have this random thing happening where we just suddenly go like, oh, this is cool. We should probably like not do this because we're working on three projects. And then like a week later, we're working on it. Um, yeah. I guess it's just like making, sh like some people work best by like sort of diving deep into that one thing and like having full attention on it. Me and JW don't work that way. It's probably just like figure out what works for you um, as it is with a lot of those things. Um, I think we had another question right there. Yeah. I don't even know if that was a satisfactory answer to your question. Was that? Was it? Form can can you like line. thumbs up or thumbs down whether that was a good question, like answer to your question? <laughs> Except for the guy with the hoodie. Yeah. Like, I, can somebody remove the guy with the hoodie? <laughs> He's been a pain, like all all show. So piracy is a weird, it's a weird, weird sort of force on the industry. Um, I guess everybody has to deal with that in their own specific way. The way we deal with it is sort of like, we really like people playing our games. Um, so what we kind of, like we won't, I've seen some developers like fully supporting piracy. I just going like on the pirate bay and like helping out people like specifically on the pirate bay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't think I would be able to do that. Um, but I'm not going to go and make it really hard on people to pirate our games either because I like people playing our games. Um, I guess like the the money, obviously, we need the money to stay alive. And I think like one of the cool things about the indie scene is that most people that buy your game like sort of genuinely care about it or about you. Um, and the people that don't pirate it, and then maybe they might start to appreciate you or like genuinely care about you. 
So I've not ever, I've not really seen it as a problem so far. Um, I, and I don't know what I would do about it. Like, it's there, right? It's this weird thing. It's pulling and pushing the industry around. But I think it's like way more... Somebody didn't turn off their phone. <laughs> ay, 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 ay. I feel like there are the people who you could potentially win over, so why not let them give you, ac why not give them access to the game? And then there are people who you would have never won over, who would have never bought it in the first place, so why even bother? I mean, it's, it's one like, of those things that changed in the industry, right? You used to um, buy a game because you needed to, um, because you needed to buy it, and then if you didn't want to buy it, you downloaded it. And now it's sort of like a lot of people that buy our games buy it because they want to see more games by us. And that's sort of like this weird thing that's sort of flipping around. So I don't know. It's, 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 a, it's a really good question. And it's a question that I think about a lot. Like what, what is Vlambeer's stance on piracy? I don't know. We'll just, we'll just like let it be the way it is and um, hope that people keep supporting us. It's nice how like all the people that have to ask a question can kind of come around the pillar and suddenly it's appear. It's like a surprise. Yeah, it's like Every who's going to be next? Uh, Look at this handsome young man. So what we do, uh, we have this really weird thing. I, t I spoke about responsibility before, right? JW is the designer, I'm the business guy. If we are an audio guy, we go with whatever they sort of do, unless it's like completely terrible or it doesn't fit what we want. Um, if we get somebody for audio, like he's the best at audio, or she's the best at audio, like that person is better at audio than us, otherwise we'd be doing it ourselves. Uh, so we just sort of trust them. Um, like if, if we fail to communicate like what we wanted, uh, we'll just say that we fail to do that, right? If we say like we need something, we need something, um, we need the sound to be sort of. This is what happens when you unlock this new thing, and we fail to communicate that that's like this really important moment in the game. So it should have like a really big audio cue. They come back with like bling, you know. We just go like, oh shit, that was not entirely what we meant. Um, but besides that, we give them like pretty much full control over everything. Um, because they're better at it than us. Uh, as for like, what do we look for in a portfolio? We don't really look for portfolios. Um, we just, you know, we know, we just get to know people at conventions or events, and we or we like their work as we came across it in like other games or stuff. Um, and that's the people we work with. Um, I get a lot of like sort of cold email calls from uh, musicians and audio. It seems like uh, it's a pretty full. Yeah competitive field at this point. I guess the best way to get into games if you're doing audio is like just get involved in game jams and stuff. Because like that way we'll see that you can make audio for games instead of just like orchestral soundtracks for websites. Um, and I feel like game jams almost specifically always need audio people. Like there's always a lot audio of, is like of a audio bit, people. Like audio is this weird thing that mm -hmm. a lot of game designers tend to forget. Um, and it's, it can be like 50% of the game, like without it, Nothing is good. It's like 50% of yeah. like any emotional impact, at least. Um, but I guess like if you want to if you want to get into making audio for video games, the best way is to start making audio for video games and get like find teams that would be interested in you. Like the guy who did Super Crate Box, we knew him because he did like weird chiptune stuff that we used to like. So we just send him an email like we like your stuff. Um, and then the guy who did um, um, Gun Gods and like the other games, um, we ran across him like because he's a friend of ours from like long ago. It's like this really sort of weird, unfair thing. Like you get need to know people and you need to be able to show what you do. I think like the best way to do that is to get to know people and show people what you do. And the one thing that allows you to do both is game jams. <laughs> Uh, the part of the interview that kind of caught my attention the, the most was uh, the part where you said uh, 
Uh, you try not to listen to any uh, negative feedback. You try to just kind of power through and stick with an idea when you know it's good. And I kind of feel like there's a fine line between being committed and being overzealous and losing sight of reality. So my question is, you know, how do you know when to listen to people? I mean, I'm sure there's some... So the thing is, you need to listen to people, but what they say is not, not necessarily what they're trying to say. That's like the thing you should be really careful about. We do, we do listen to people, but we listen to them in different ways. We, like, if we're playtesting, we're looking at, are they progressing through the game the way that we want? It's like, is this item like, too expensive? Like, does it take too long for them to get something new? Um, is this like, the best way to be introducing these things? Are the people like, looking like they're having fun? Like, we look at the faces of playtesters a lot, because you can see, like, you, if they go like, you know, you just look at the screen and go like, oh, they didn't get that. Um, I play test a lot in the train to work, like ridiculous fishing. I've been testing that like every day in the train to work uh, to the office. Um, like I just ask a random person that looks really bored, like, hi, I make video games. Would you like to try a game? They go, like nine out of ten times they go like, uh, sh sure. <laughs> um, I mean, like, they will obviously say like, things like, oh, I think it's pretty, or, uh, oh, the music is nice, or, uh, or oh, I, I think like, th th it feels a bit slow, or something like that. But like, the thing I care about is, like, do they look like they're having fun, and do they keep playing? Like, that's the main thing that Ridiculous Fishing is about. Ridiculous Fishing is this sort of infinite feedback loop where like, everything you do is sort of supposed to give you a sense of progression, or like, at least, like, um, Positivity, I guess, just like keeping getting more and better and faster and like more explosive and more ridiculous. Uh, so as long as they keep playing, like that's going well. As soon as they go like, I don't know, like that's that's like that's where I need to be paying attention to like what they're saying and sort of figure out what they're getting at, because like I said, they're not they're likely not game designers. It's likely that they don't know what their issue is. It's more that this is what they feel. And the way they feel is never wrong, right? If they say, like, I don't feel this is fun. Like, they're not wrong. They just don't feel it's fun. The question you should be asking yourself is, why do they feel that way? So what they say is not necessarily what they're trying to say. And that's, like, the, the thing that I tried to say back in the interview. Like, if somebody says, this game is shit, like, we'll be a bit sad that that guy thought it was shit. Um, and if... Two million people say it's shit. Well, then it's probably like <laughs> shit. Um, but if there's like a few people that go like, I think that doesn't feel right. We don't just fix that. We try to figure out like if that is what they were trying to say and like what they might be trying to say instead of that. Is that sort of an answer? Yeah. I Good. think uh, I think that's it though. I think that's all we have time for. Okay. So I think we're supposed to wrap up. Okay. Thanks for talking to me. Yeah, no, it was fun.